Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Moore, and this is Propology 101, and I hope we can prop up your imagination. Our guest today is Rick Sternbach. There he is. And if you don't know who he is, well, then you're not really into Star Trek. Um, so, uh, Rick, if you could give us some history of some of the shows you've worked on, you know, because I know you've worked on more than Star Trek. <laughs> so, yeah, well, that, that, there you that's go. true. It goes back a ways. It goes back a ways. And good, good to see you again, Mike. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, I, I started out as a uh, slightly confused college student. Um, you know, I started out as an art major, switched over to biology, and then left uh, when it became evident that I could sell my art. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I, I, you know, I got hooked up with a lot of um, science fiction writers and uh, uh, book publishers, editors, uh, you know, all, all through the, uh, the early 70s. Uh, got to do book and magazine cover art. And most of it was, uh, well, I can't even say most because it was half and half uh, astronomical art and science fiction art, okay? And I, I liked putting the two together. Um, you know, the science fiction stuff that the, that the editors uh, threw at me uh, were for the most part space-based, you know, or high-tech hardware-based uh -huh. stuff. And I, I did that all through, uh, all through the 70s, um, up until, up until I went to uh, the World SF Convention in Kansas City in 1976, okay? The World Con in 76. And uh, yeah, I put, you know, I put my art up on display and hung out with all my, uh, uh, you know, fa fan pals and, and writer friends. And uh, there was this little room where they had some costumes and some artwork on the walls and some representatives from a movie that was coming out called Star Wars. Yep. Mark Hamill was there and he was he was jumping around in a Star Wars t-shirt and they had costumes for Chewie and 3PO and Darth Vader, I think. Um Charlie Lippincott, uh, who was the publicist who, who uh, 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 passed away just recently, I, you know, I got to talk to him and Gary Kurtz, the, one of the producers. Mm -hmm. And the artwork that I mentioned, all around the walls of this room, there were prints of all of Ralph McQuarrie's pre-production art. And my mouth just hung open looking at this stuff. Oh my God. And, you know, in, 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 in later years, you know, I, I learned, uh, you know, Ralph had done work for Boeing, you know, he knew his hardware, he knew his, his drawing and painting. Um, and I wondered to myself, holy cow, could I maybe make the move from the East Coast to Los Angeles? and get into this kind of thing. Well, it took a while. It took me like another year to, to do it. But uh, uh, when I came out for a couple of weeks in uh, late 1977, the next year, I got to visit uh, 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 some of the studios like MGM and uh, um, uh, I got to, to meet with some of the folks at Paramount uh, who were just happening to be doing Star Trek Phase Two, mm -hmm. and met up with Joe Jennings, who was the production designer, and met Mike Miner and uh, some of the set designers. and And Joe was Joe was very straight with me. I mean, he was he was you know a real straight shooter, and he said, "Look, I'm sorry, I don't have anything for you." Okay, all right. You know, I, I, I appreciated his honesty, but, you know, I left my samples. Mm -hmm. I left the resume, left my samples. Uh, I visited Disney, and 
very unexpectedly got accepted to work on the black hole. Very cool. Okay, so suddenly my, my, my whole life was in turmoil <laughs> because I had to go back to Connecticut. I had to like pack a few bags and, and supplies, come back to LA and uh, worked on uh, the black hole for, I, I would guess about two and a half months. Um, and then they stopped uh, work in the art department basically because they, they said, look, we're sorry, guys, we have to go back and work on the script. Okay, so suddenly I had my first, you know, uh, Southern California film job and just as quickly lost it and wondered <laughs> what the heck am I gonna do? Okay, well, I, I, I made up, you know, I, I made up uh, some slack with uh, 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 paintings that I could send back to the New York uh, publishing market. Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah. All right. So I, I continued doing some, some book and magazine work while I was scouting around for some more work. Um, well, I, I got to meet up with the folks from um, uh, Abel and Associates and saw what they were doing for sort of the, the phase two type of work, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and um, they didn't have anything for me either. But I left my samples, okay? Uh -huh. Fine, all right, well, um, I would guess it would have to be like April of 78, thereabouts, and um, I get a call from Joe Jennings mm -hmm. at Paramount. They're announcing the feature in the morning. Do you want to come in? <laughs> out of the blue. I mean, totally out of the blue. I mean, and you know, I mean, it, had I not left my stuff with them and gotten to talk with them about science fiction, about art, about film and all this, you know, that, that wouldn't have happened. Um, so, uh, uh, it, you know, we made arrangements for me to come down to the studio when, uh, you know, the, the, the day that they were doing the press uh, event on stage. Mike Miner's big painting of the Enterprise was up on one wall and the cast members were all there. Um, and uh, at the end of the event, okay, I was a new hire. Okay. Well, that's, that's how a lot of stuff happens out here. That's how, yeah, yeah. Um, you never know what's going to happen when you're when you're talking to somebody. Like, hey, right. So so, you know. So this was 1978. I was still a newbie when it came to uh, uh, you know film and TV design. But honest to God, I had such a an amazing, wonderful, old school set of people to work with, mm -hmm. um, you know, Mike Miner loved science fiction film, okay? Um, uh, John Cartwright, who was the lead set designer, okay, father of Angela and Veronica, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, uh, some of the other uh, uh, set designers, uh, Danny Maltese, uh, Luce Glitgerber, um, uh, you, you know, I mean, I, I learned a number of things from, from Joe himself, before he left to work on Shogun and Harold Michelson came in. Same thing, Harold was, you know, he, he had worked for Hitchcock, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, I learned so much from Harold and, uh, uh, and from Mike Miner. Uh, and I, you know, I was put to work uh, with Lee Cole doing a lot of this, you know, high tech um, uh, control panel art mm -hmm. and some little bits and pieces for Dick Rubin, who was the uh, uh, prop master. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I got to learn all of the different departments on the lot in the months that I worked on this film. Uh, and, and just, you know, it, I don't even have the words 
you know, all these years later, uh, for what an amazing experience that was being accepted into the fold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that is one of the things about, and, and, I'll, and, and I don't want to, I, I don't want to put it in a, in a term that either one of us are, is, <laughs> as, as people who have been in the industry for a while, okay, um, a lot of the new people coming in don't have and can't get this type of experience where, because nowadays I, I find a lot of the newer people who are in charge and stuff are more of a, oh, well, you know, that's kind of a trade secret of how I do things. And it's like, <laughs> okay, stop. Somebody had to have taught you how to do most of that. So why don't you spread it around? And, and back in the day, when I first started working uh, in, in the film industry, uh, and when I joined, uh, you know, the, the union, I was put with, since I had never built, been on set building sets as for a hammer call for 44, I was put with three old timers to show me the way to make sure I was doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. And, and even they said, okay, so you're, so what do you do? I go, well, I actually build the props. That's my, that's why I'm, I'm joining, you know, specialty props, specialty costumes. And that's why I'm in the union now. And they go, oh, so you actually build the hand props. He goes, well, us around here, especially the old guys, we, uh, we actually build the sets. And I said, okay. He goes, and, and this was, this was on red heat when I was joining the union. And we were building a cafe out in the middle of downtown LA. And he goes, hear all that work that's going on upstairs? He goes, I go, yeah. He goes, that's all the guys who don't want to work with us. He goes, those guys are up there. There's 40 guys on the roof of this structure, which is only rated for 10. And they are, and they're up there with nail guns, not even looking at where the beams are. They're just laying down plywood going da, 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 da. And, and so we actually left where we were working because nails were coming through the wood because they're only using quarter inch plywood. Ah, so we went outside to build the headers and stuff for the doors yeah. and all that. And he goes, goes, you know, you, you act like you actually want to learn something here. I go, well, I do. I said, I, I yeah. would rather learn from someone who knows how to do it the right way than be one of those guys up on the roof shooting nails through, through the quarter-inch plywood and falling yeah. through. Yeah. So it's it's yeah. that type of education exactly. on exactly. the job. Exactly. I, I enjoyed yeah. my entire time with the guys that I was working with. And I'm sure, you know, with Mike Miner, how, how can you go wrong? Exactly, exactly. And, uh, you know, I mean, through Mike, I got to meet Bob Burns and, uh, you know, that that whole that whole crowd. And uh, I got to help out with some of the Halloween stuff. And that was just a, a ton of fun, oh, a yeah. ton of fun. But uh, I mean, you know, now, actually, I should go I should go back a little bit. Uh, when I was still living in Connecticut um, and I've, t I've told this story before. Uh, I saw a, a little blurb in the newspaper, uh, and this was 1970, yeah, 1974. Uh, there was a little blurb in the paper, uh, Gene Roddenberry's coming to Yale University to show The Cage. Wow. Okay, eh, so what did I do? All right, I, I mean, I was working for the New York uh, book market and, and stuff, but I... I was so close to uh, New Haven, Connecticut, where Yale is. Um, I cold called the studio. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I don't know who Gene Roddenberry's assistant was at the time, but I, you know, I, I introduced myself. I said I'm an illustrator, uh, you know, uh, working in books and magazines, and I understand Gene's coming to town. Would it be possible to maybe meet with them for a few minutes after the screening? And they said yes. Oh. Well, he was very personable. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and 1974, you got to remember, this is only two years after the last moon landing. Uh-huh. Okay, this was like right after Skylab uh, and before the Apollo-Soyuz mission. All right, so space was happening, right? Space was still happening. Uh, and I got to meet Gene um, after the screening. We ended up talking for like, I don't know, an hour and a half, two hours. And years later, after that, I discovered that Fred Durant, who was a, a curator for astronautics at the Air and Space Museum in Washington, mm -hmm. had mentioned my name to Gene. Oh in correspondence and I finally got to see Fred's letters and I had no idea. So some guardian angels were like looking over me, you know, <laughs> through the, through the mid to late seventies. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, I just consider myself astoundingly lucky to have made the connections, you know, with Gene with the studio, with, uh, you know, everybody who, who worked on um, the motion picture, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and, and, you know, and, and after, after the motion picture, okay, once, once my involvement wrapped, um, <laughs> I immediately went to work on Cosmos with Carl Sagan. Uh -huh. So there was no vacation time. <laughs> Well, but you got to take it when you can get it. You know, so so you know, I'm going from I'm going from from you know super futuristic science fictiony starships to uh, you know back to my my astronomical roots. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, you know, I was part of the uh, the the uh, team at uh, KCET in in LA. Um, you know, to to help design a lot of the visual effects before we had computers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Although I did get to work a little bit at the uh, computer lab at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. You know, uh, getting some some very very early experience on their their you know eight bit system of uh, with a light pen uh -huh. <laughs> and and a, a very early tablet and doing maps of the the moons of Jupiter, <laughs> you know, uh, and and also you know working working with the rest of uh, our uh, art crew, um, uh, John Lomberg and uh, John Allison, uh, Don Davis, Adolf Schaller, me. Um, yeah, you know, we, we got into building, uh, um, you know, planetary models and doing giant cell animation mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, helping to, helping to invent the entire universe in about two years. <laughs> yeah. You know? and, and, so, and knowing what it takes for, for doing animation, that is a lot of work. It was a lot of cells. There were 27 field cells. They were huge. Uh, and, and we got in there with the little tiny airbrushes and we're doing galaxies, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know so, and, 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 you know, and we got to watch, we got to watch the, you know, the, the development of computer imagery um, in the years following Cosmos. Um, and this would, you know, come back and become a huge part of what we did on Next Generation and those shows. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I mean, it's like, um, uh, I'm trying to think here. It, it was a, it, it's like when you're doing animation for, for a show, you know, you're doing your cells and so on. And then you're doing overlays and putting in an optical printer. A lot of people don't understand that the early stuff, you may have had six or seven or eight or 10 planes 
mm -hmm. in an optical printer, and each one is an element to that one shot that you've already created on a separate system already. Mm -hmm. And you have to combine those and just getting the optical printer aligned. Uh, I, I worked on, um, I was working at, with, with a friend uh, right out of high school um, for uh, History of the World Part One. Okay. The, the, uh -huh. end, the, the end sequence Jews in space with the uh -huh. spaceship. Okay. I was the only one who actually didn't need glasses. <laughs> so I actually had to sit there while they're uh, making all the micro adjustments on the optical printer to make sure everything was lining up properly. Uh -huh. And I'm uh -huh. like, wow. So you, and, and we were only doing three planes. I'm like, and, and it, it took 12 hours to align what we did align. I said, how, this is crazy. Yeah, this, this, is, this, this all sounds very familiar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, mean, it's, I, it's, I, I got to, uh, I, uh, I got to, uh, to see how they, they worked the down shooter over at Howard Anderson. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mike Miner wrote up the count sheets for the animation for the, uh, the asteroid um, incident on the uh, Star Trek the motion picture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I did this little asteroid in pen and ink, and uh, they 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 shot the elements over at, at Howard Anderson, which was like it was it was right on the lot. Uh -huh. It was up near it was up near uh, near Melrose. Uh, so you know, I helped uh, put a bunch of these little art elements together. Mike wrote up the count sheet. We took it over to Anderson, and uh, you know, I got to I got to see this this animation camera, you know, looking down at the the uh, the cells. Uh -huh. okay? um, and you know, I I never operated that sort of stuff myself, but I could see ah, okay, here's the here's the pin registration bar, here's here's the field, okay, there's the camera, um, you know, learning about about things like bypacking. And, uh, um, you know, these, these were things that, that, that um, we, we actually ended up doing a bit on Cosmos as well, uh -huh. uh, where I, I had some paintings that I had done of some uh, spacecraft, okay, and they were shot at a different facility, but, I, you know, I, I, I knew, oh, okay, they're putting it on this down shooter, and it's got XY travel on the bed, and uh, oh, oh, this is this stuff all makes sense. <laughs> yeah, finally. You know, yeah. yeah, pretty, pretty amazing. You know, looking back at, at all of the old techniques, uh, and you know, watching things evolve, mm -hmm. uh, you know, into into things like Photoshop, and uh, um, you know, some of the some of the early. Um, computer animation programs and things. And, we, you know, our, our brains just started, you know, turning. And uh -huh. I said, oh, yeah, we could do this, and then we could do this. And <laughs> well, well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's like the first season of, of Next Generation. I, I came in halfway through the first season of Next Gen. During the, the first half, I was working at another shop, which we were doing commercials and all this other stuff. But Gary Hutzel came in mm -hmm. to the shop because they had apparently my boss and him had been friends for, for 20 years already. And, and Gary Hutzel wasn't that old in the first place. I'm like, I was in 20 years. Um, but anyway, <laughs> and he came in with an idea as because you guys were like originally taking photographs and trying to bend them around and stuff. And then he said, well, meaning you, you would take it, he would take an image and try and turn it into a planet or something like that through some computer program or something way yeah. back when. Mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. but he came in and said, okay, so I need a projection unit that I can project these photo, these, these, you know, uh, eight by 10 slides onto something. Cause I have to have a lot of different planets in, in like yesterday, you know, for all these shots. So, he and, and my boss went into the office and talked for about three or four hours. And came, they came out and go, okay, so this is what we're going to do, guys. And, and uh, that's when the, Gary's 
terraformer was in, was was uh, manufactured, the very first version, uh, which we were taking a a dome. Believe it or not, we did a com a Japanese commercial where we had to have these like two and a half foot half domes. Mm -hmm. We took the inside of of one of those domes and and it was for a as I said a Japanese commercial, and we had to sand blast the inside of it you know to receive an image and what was what was interesting was then it was like okay so these eight by ten slides now have to go on this mechanism with a stepper motor that turns at uh, you know it's it's like for it for it to travel the entire length in front of the projector portion of it it was like 45 minutes for it to travel basically 10 inches. So after it moved 10 inches, but you never needed a, a, a sequence that long. <laughs> but um, so, so basically as it traveled, it made the rotation of the planet. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay, now I get it. So you know, I was like, oh, okay. And I, and I was like, so you're working on Star Trek. Oh, okay, whatever. Because <laughs> we at, that, at that time, I was working at that shop. We are doing commercials, but we were also doing uh, stuff for Rocketdyne and stuff like the, uh, tabletop models. We were doing the, the you know, F1 engine and blah, blah, you know, whatever. Whatever came through the door, sure, we'll do it. Including, <laughs> including study models for the uh the, the telescope arrays the, the 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 big dishes all made out of brass soldered together mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and uh so when when gary hutzel came in we're like oh something different let's work on that for a little while <laughs> um, built it up yeah, fun stuff fun stuff he, he took it to set every, you know gene loved it but then for me it was it was a few months later one of my friends calls me up and goes, hey, do you think you could come by and pick up some molds for vacuum farming for some stuff we're doing? And then I was like three weeks of me coming back and forth vacuum farming his parts. I'm suddenly now working at a shop who's doing Star Trek. And I'm like, oh, so, and I mean, you know, I like Star the original series and everything. But I was like, hey, you know, whatever, whatever's going to come and, and make me money is what I want to work on. <laughs> you know, because, and then suddenly I'm, you know, I'm working on Trek uh, halfway through the, the first season and, you know, and the rest is history, just like, you you know, here's, here's your job. <laughs> Please do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that's, you know, I, th those are the little things that are like, oh, okay. So that was my first connection to Star Trek as far as working on it. And then suddenly, whoop slip under the door hey you want to come and work at the shop here because you know you're pretty quick and yeah. we need quick <laughs> well i mean you know and, and when when we were on next generation uh, i mean to begin with uh andy probert and i were like the first two art people hired uh -huh. before herman zimmerman was even brought in as the production designer so Andy was working on some concepts. I started, uh, you, you know, helping out with uh, like a foam core model of the bridge. Uh huh. Uh, and you know, I, 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 I think I think I learned pretty early on that uh, yes, you know, drawings drawings are good if you know if you're coming up with something that no one has ever seen before. Yeah. Okay, and you need to you, and you need to show things off. Um, and yes, you could do, you know, uh, six different views of a set, but I, I discovered very early on that if you gave them a model, if you gave them a foam core model, um, you know, even if the set designers had not finished all the plan and elevation views, uh -huh. if you could at least build enough of the set, okay, uh -huh. The producers could walk around it. The directors could look at it. You mm -hmm. know, um, 
Rick Colby, who was one of our directors, uh, you know, I, we built a model of, of this one set and he instantly, you know, could look at this model and say, oh, yeah, yeah we could wild this wall out here or I could, you know, uh, put the camera up to this window and shoot through here. And, you know, you could just see their eyes light up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's, and that's the thing is, is because some people, I, I know you've heard it before from, from producers, directors, and writers is, I can't visualize it until I see it. Well, you know, and, and some of them, I mean, to their credit, some of them were very good at reading blueprints. Yes. Okay. Yeah. With, you know, they can look down on a plan view of, uh, you know, some, some alien uh, town square kind of a thing uh -huh. and, and see where they wanted to put things. Okay. Yeah. But if you gave them a model at, um, you know, quarter inch scale or, or uh, uh, eighth inch scale, whatever, uh, you know, then they could they could say, okay, look, I can bring the camera in through here. We have to move this little thing over, uh, and it, you know, they would do the hand gestures, you know, yeah. and, and and say, okay, oh, and then we can bring the camera up the stairs, yeah, and they would get yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I liked drawing. Okay, uh, my dad was an architect. I learned how to do it at the age of two and a half. Okay, uh -huh. so and I learned I learned about you know blueprinting as as a young boy. <laughs> you, know? Uh -huh. uh, you know, so I I understood this stuff. Um, and yes, I could do uh, you know perspective sketches of. Um, you know, a, a set. Um, but what I really wanted to do was spaceships. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, yeah. But, but yeah. having a, a, any type of visual device, like like doing a, a, a phone core model and stuff, it always helps get everything across. And in some cases, it helps them go, oh, that's not going to work. You know? Yeah. Well, and, 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 and some... Yeah, and in some cases, in some cases, uh, they got a, a much faster assessment of, okay, what is this going to cost? Yeah. Um, to the point where, okay, they could look at the model and say, okay, look, we can't afford to build a second story on here. So how can we how can we eliminate the the upper floor and still get the shots that we want? And that kind of and and I felt really good about that. Uh -huh. you know, we, we provided them with the tools that they needed, um, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, then I could get back to starships, the hand props, uh -huh. um, uh, you know, some, some graphic uh, things. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, have, I have told people before, okay, I really hate doing storyboards. Because well, I'm not very, I'm not very good at it. All right, but I well, did I those. I, I did I, those too. I don't think a, I don't think a lot of people are good at it because they keep hiring people doing stick figures. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I, it, it I, serves I, a different purpose. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been told, I've been told uh, that that uh, you know, for storyboards, you don't need more than just you know some simple figures. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And except that I have seen some of my my artist uh, colleagues who are very good at it. Yeah. All right. And I felt astoundingly bummed out <laughs> because I couldn't do what they were doing. OK. Um, and, and these were guys who could, you know, they could do comic art. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, or graphic novel art and that sort of thing. Okay, I have never been good at that. All right, I'm I'm more into the mechanics. Okay, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've done some, uh, you know, some paintings of human figures, eh, except they were usually in spacesuits. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I mean, you know, like like I tell folks, you know, like, we did what we could with what we had. Exactly, and always, every every week, because it was. You know, we have an eight-day shooting schedule. What are you going to do? Oh, we we put in some weekends. Oh, I, I put in every weekend. 
every season. We were I was in, Sundays. In there every day yeah. because some stuff, you know. Oh, hey, hey, Rick, did they just add this piece to, to the show? Oh, yeah. yeah, I'll have that drawing to you in about an hour after they approve it. Okay, yeah. and that's Friday night. <laughs> and I, I, I'm going to tell you a funny, a funny prop story. Uh, okay. Uh, um. I had uh, I had designed uh, a a Klingon uh, disruptor made from a belt a belt buckle, uh, two oh. pieces of a shoe, you know I that was, sort of I thing. Was, I yeah I I was there when that was built. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. So I designed it. I you know I handed off the sketches to Joe Longo, who who was absolutely amazing. He's such a such a fun guy to to, to work with. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the gun, the gun components were made. Uh -huh. All right. They were being filmed and round about, I don't know, 1130 in the morning, Joe comes up to the art department with a cardboard box and there's pieces in the box uh -huh. and some of them are broken. All right. There was a mishap on stage. You know, it was dropped or something. All right. Okay. And he said, look, uh, they're going back to shooting after lunch. Can you fix this? Oh, yeah. So, okay. You know, get out the super glue. Get out the, get out the model paint. Uh -huh. All right. And I was, fortunately, I was able to get it back into shooting shape, okay? It was, you know, not a hero shot or anything, but just enough where they could, you know, get their last couple of scenes. Uh -huh. And Joe came back and retrieved it. And, you know, all right, whew, my work is done. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh yeah, but you know, fortunately, this you know that sort of thing did not happen often. No, but but you know? occasionally you'd go, "What'd you guys do?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, truck right yeah. over it. What? <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, we all know about you know uh, stunt stunt uh, versions of things like you know rubber phasers and and yeah. rubber tricorders and all this kind of thing, and that you know that that's terrific. That that's. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, but only if they use them. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we've, we've heard of broken things, and we've heard of things that had to get fixed and, and, and all this. But, uh, I mean, you know, for me, um, uh, you know, my work ended on um, uh, Voyager, yeah. okay? Uh, but that's, you know, with, with uh, the motion picture and Next Gen, DS9, and, and Voyager, and a little bit of stuff on Nemesis. Okay, that's that's 15 years. Okay, oh, yeah. that's a chunk. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Uh, that's that's a, and, that's yeah you know, a lot. You know, and and some of some of my artist buddies, you, you know, they really wanted to get into feature films, and I, I give them a big thumbs up for that. Uh huh. You know, and and some of them turn into production designers, and I think that's fabulous. I think that's amazing. Uh, so, you know, a lot of us who got to work on things like Next Gen and DS9, okay, um, you, you know, I, th I think that was, that, that was such a, uh, um, uh, such a developing spot for people to get into, to, you know, other crafts, uh, mm -hmm. other positions on, on productions. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think we've done good. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I think so as well. I mean, I, it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I've worked on during next gen at, at the shops. In some cases we were working on two or three different movies at the same time, but yeah. we still had to get Star Trek done. And, you know, when you work on a, 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 a science fiction show like Star Trek that has new episodes and new people, you know, races, you know, everything, every eight days, you end up honing your skills of how can I do that piece, mm -hmm. make it look good, 
and still be and and under you know within budget and and ready for shooting mm -hmm. and and right. and that's what a lot of people who did work on Star Trek ended up honing those skills. But what I find funny, well, it's not funny. What I find is is that some of the people who were working on the show and had been working in film and television for a long time are suddenly on a show that has so many elements that have to be done in that same amount of time. And most of them uh, that I've talked to went, you know what? All those other shows were great, but working on Star Trek was a challenge and it it showed what people could do if they just put their mind to it. Mm -hmm. it, oh, yeah. it was it was amazing feats of magic. Doing some of those caves uh, in on on uh, next gen and and DS nine, where half of the, the the soundstage is nothing but caves and and, and fiberglass walls, and it, it it was nothing on Friday. Monday morning, I, I would come mm -hmm. down to set to drop off some stuff and go, where did that come from? Yeah, and yeah. it was a, it was amazing. Well, you know we've we've got we've gotten to see over the years we have gotten to see such an evolution of you know uh, physical sets and uh, uh, physical environments now turned into green screen. Yeah. You know, and, and, and you know, I'm uh, I'm not in a production situation anymore, but I am just amazingly interested in seeing how all of this has evolved. OK, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have virtual sets uh -huh. on things like the Mandalorian. Oh, yeah. And those are big. Too. Holy mackerel. <laughs> you know, have things, have things changed, okay? Um, oh, yeah. But, but the one thing I love is that, okay, miniatures are not totally replaced by CGI, okay? Uh -huh. Physical miniatures are still with us, which is, which is terrific. Well, yeah, because, because, you know, when you're doing special effects, it's supposed to enhance the show, not be the show. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, there's good CGI. Yes, there there's is. Good miniatures. Uh, they both have a place in in uh, you know in film and television. Um, you know, I I I loved seeing the process by which miniatures were were built. Uh huh. Okay. You know, the drawings left my table, and suddenly this army of people got in. You know, cutting stuff. Making molds, yep. uh, you know, making making fiberglass castings, okay, painting, adding details, and, I, and I, you know, I, I I will go back to what I saw um, in Tony Meininger's shop when they were doing Voyager, mm -hmm. and I stopped in every so often to see how they were doing this, and they had like a bathtub of blue rubber. Mm -hmm. You know, with parts in them. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And little old me, little old me just provided the drawings. Okay. I mean, they were good drawings. You know, they, they were precise drawings, right? Uh -huh. um, but just to see the process, um, you, you know, coming up with the master parts with the, the deflector lines engraved in there. Mm -hmm. uh, dimensional details added and then put into rubber, yep. you know, and just, I said, oh my God, <laughs> you oh, know, yeah. and, um, and, and, and that's, you know, that's so, the thing is it's the craftsmanship. Well, and, and it's the different crafts that yeah. get involved in this sort of thing. I mean, you, you look at, uh, or you look at a, at a typical hand prop. Okay. All right. Uh, there's a line in the script. Okay, so and so has a phaser. Okay, I draw the phaser. You guys make the phaser. Uh -huh. 
okay, it goes onto stage. It goes into the actor's hand. They shoot it, and then they add the the visual effects for things like the beams. Yeah. Okay. The number of people involved is like, you know, there's all of these folks involved in getting one thing to work right. Yeah. You know, and, and to end up on your TV every week. Well, and, and that's that's what's the, the people who, who do all this planning is like like when you're doing you know a setup for animation. Unless you have the right mindset, you're never going to understand it because there's so many steps. And okay, well, how many frames are we doing per second? Uh, what's what's this? Okay, are we going to have a sliding uh, background? Are we going to have a stationary background? Blah blah blah. blah. All mm -hmm. these things. Yep. It's it's all the planning and handing out the pieces of the puzzle to everybody who needs it, so that they all come together at the end. Yeah, and, and, you know, most audience members don't see all of the, the stuff happening in the background. Exactly. Okay, you know, uh, lately I have been re-watching <laughs> Sean the Sheep. Uh-huh. Okay. Love the show. Just all the stop-motion animation, things like Wallace and Gromit and, uh, uh, you know, the, the Leica productions and, and things, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of stop motion, uh -huh. right? And I, I can, you know, and, and, and this goes back to like, like Harryhausen. Yep. Okay. Oh, and yeah. seeing how all of that was done, you know, I mean, you talk about, about physical work to get a simple character to, you know, to smile or throw a ball or, you know, all of the stuff that goes into that, mm -hmm. you know, yes, we get to see later, maybe in a documentary, okay? Yeah, maybe. Uh, <laughs> maybe yeah, maybe, okay. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, hands come in and move things and they shoot a frame, okay? Yeah. So I have, I have, you know, I have never done any professional work in stop motion. I did some stuff with my dad's Super 8 camera. Uh-huh. Okay, I, I back did, when I was I a teenager. Myself. Right? Okay. Yeah. A Super 8 camera with a cable release? Yeah. Quick, quick, you, quick, quick. Maybe two frames, maybe four. I don't know. Oh, no. But, yeah, but it gets you set up. It yeah. gets your mind set up to, to learn the process. Yeah, when when I was when I was doing that, uh, the history of the world part one, helping them align that. Um, I was coming in on Friday evenings and working the weekends with them, and at that point they were doing the Pillsbury Doughboy commercials, and I was assisting on on some of those back then in high school, and I was like. So is that foam latex? Because you know what? You, you see the finger come in? Mm -hmm. It's not foam latex. Those bodies are cast hard wax. And there's, you know, that the, the hand is not even a real hand. It's a cast hand that's been painted up to look real. Mm -hmm. And it's boop, 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 boop. Yeah, yeah. You know, so they've got multiple bodies that slowly are depressing as the finger's going in. Yeah. You know, and all that, and it's it's crazy. It's, and a lot of those character parts are now like three D printed. Yes. Based on CG animation, <laughs> so it's like, oh my, you know, my my brain explodes. You know, when I when I hear about things like uh, uh, Coraline. Uh huh. Okay, where they had a box full of mouths or yes. a box full of of uh, you know noses or or hands, and it's wait. This this started out as a polygon model yep. in a three D program, and now it's stop motion. Yeah, it's a replacement wow. stop motion. Wow. Well, yeah, and 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 there and what's funny is is okay. So you're in the the three D program, and you're you're taking the hand and you're going okay. So this hand's gonna do this. So you're gonna have okay. Start there now. Print that hand. Okay, right, now start right. and, exactly. yeah. and then, yeah. so, you're, so you're doing stop motion to make stop motion. 
Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's astounding. It's a, it's, it's just amazing that, that those sorts of things are possible. Uh -huh. uh, and we get to see the end result in a story, you know, yeah. and I love it. I love it. I totally love it, you know, because it's, you know, I mean, the reason I love a lot of this stuff um, is because I don't do it. And I like to be amazed by the behind the scenes stuff. Uh -huh. Okay. I mean, you know, the stuff that I did, um, uh, yes, I understand that, you know, from start to finish. Okay. Yeah. And I, I won't say it's boring, but it's like, okay, this is very well known stuff. I know how to draw this stuff. Um, uh, you know, I can make some suggestions for, okay, for lights, for batteries, for, you know, whatever the, the prop or the spaceship miniature needs. Um, and then it gets done. But you know, I look at I look at a stop motion um, uh, animation or you know full CG animation with you know a real attention to style. Okay, and that's that's where I sit there and I'm like, oh wow, all right, make me amazed. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, let, let me go through some of these questions because people wanted me to ask you a bunch. Of yeah, questions. yeah. So, so then we'll get back to some other stuff that I know you really want to talk about. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, do you have any artists that have inspired you through the years? Any specific Ooh, ones? Artists inspired. Well, I mentioned I mentioned Ralph McQuarrie uh -huh. uh, as as the real you know eye opener. Uh, for the film work, um, but uh, uh, for a lot of my space and astronomical work, uh, Chesley Bonestell. I mean, goodness, I you know I got to see books like Conquest of Space in elementary school, um, and uh, um, other artists like Bob McCall. I knew I knew I knew McCall. Um, you know I um, you know. His art was was an amazing inspiration over the years. Um, you know, in, in different fields, uh, you know, I have different artists that, uh, that that I really look up to. Um, uh, a lot of my colleagues in the International Association of Astronomical Artists, uh, you know, we, we all kind of funnel back to Bonestell. Uh -huh. um, you know, other other artists. Uh, um, Around the same time, um, Rolf Klepp, uh, Mel Hunter, um, uh, Fred Freeman, um, you know, a, a lot of the artists who, who did images of the space program to come, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and this is back before there was anything in Earth orbit, okay? You know, I, I love telling people, look, I was a kid. I was around when there was nothing in orbit, zip, all right? And I've gotten to see everything happen over time, okay? And I also love telling people, like, every major space program started with art. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, Somebody and, had to have the idea. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and even even the artists who were, let's say, working for the aerospace contractors, you know, uh, they're not household names, but they they showed us what things would eventually look like. Okay, as designs changed, as hardware was being built, uh, you know, rockets were assembled, uh, you know, in Florida, uh, and and you know, got us off to the moon. I've, I saw three Apollo launches from the Cape. That's that's how crazy a space nerd I was. Yeah, I didn't get. I only saw them on TV. Yeah. Well, I you know I I, I graduated high school and I told my folks, uh, look, I have to go to the Cape for eleven. I have to go see Apollo eleven. Mm -hmm. You know, it was ten miles away, but I still saw it. Yeah. <laughs> Apollo well. thirteen. Apollo 13, I got to see from the press site. Cool. That was very cool. 
It was. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, any anybody who uh, anybody who who did uh, uh, space art, um, you know, when I was growing up, you know, big thumbs up. And then here, here's what it's actually difficult because it depends on the job that you're doing. Uh, it says, what is your inspiration when you're creating the designs you do? Well, it depends on the job you're trying to do. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, well, with things like, okay, with things like Star Trek, okay, there were certain stylistic models that were already in place. Uh, Okay, Starfleet. You know, you, you could not you could not um, confuse Starfleet and Romulan. Okay, that's stylistically they were very different. Klingon, Cardassian. Um, you know, all of the different you know major um, cultures in Trek um, had their own stylistic rules. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes, we could modify. We could evolve. Um, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to have, have sort of followed some of the initial rules and, um, um, you know, invent things along the way. Yeah. I mean, if we, if we had a, um, you know, a new race that came in, okay. We don't know what the ships look like. We don't know what the props look like. We don't know what style the, the costume is going to be in, uh, -huh. uh or the makeup. The makeup and the costumes for me started to kind of drive some of the styles. Uh -huh. Okay, you look at the Herosian, uh -huh. right? Um, their costumes and their makeup kind of drove the way I designed their ship. Okay, mm -hmm. um, the Cardassian, the Cardassian, the neck, the flared neck. Uh -huh was a major influence on the design of the space station. Okay. Uh, Herman Zimmerman, he, you know, he said it, he said it right out. We had to think like Cardassians. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so everything that, that, um, you know, all of the surface detailing that I put into the space station. Okay. Was to try to marry up the hardware with the people. Uh huh. With the characters, right, okay. and and that kind of, that that pretty much drove a lot of the stuff that I did. Yeah, and I and and I think it it blended well. I mean, when you some of the drawings you did for Cardassia itself had some of those same lines, uh, you know, some of those conceptual drawings uh, that fit perfectly in with the whole the whole thought. Well, we were, you know, all of us, uh, you know, like uh, uh, the DS9 art department was a separate unit that uh, I, I was not, uh, uh, you know, I was not involved in uh, on a, uh, uh, every single day because yeah. I was over on, I was on, on TNG and Voyager. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but, uh, you know, all of us, all of us who contributed to the design work on DS9, uh, we, we were very much in sync. Uh -huh. uh, you know, so the set designers were doing, you know, the, the, the like the interior of the uh, um, um, the interior of ops and uh -huh. the uh, the living quarters on the station. All of those architectural things, um, you know, were Cardassian. You could yeah. not mistake those for anything else. Exactly. So. Exactly. Yeah. Um, let's see here. What is your favorite prop costume or set that you have designed for Star Trek? Favorite prop? Um, okay, didn't do costume design. Uh, what was the other one? set? Set. No, the sets. The sets were the, the territory of the production designer and the set designers. Uh -huh. okay. I got to I got to visualize some of uh, yeah. what they were doing, but I did not. Um, you know, come up with a lot of these designs, uh, you know, right out of thin air. Right. The props, yes. Okay. Right. So I, I would guess, you know, in terms of, of, of uh, a favorite prop, um, I think it's a toss up for me between um, 
the type two phaser from season three mm -hmm. and the tricorder. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and you know, and, and I could start adding to the list. Okay, the type four compression rifle. Yeah. Okay, I the thought Voyager, was, yeah. was cool. You know, it was a cool design that fit in with everything else. Right. Uh, so right. yeah, yeah, the rifle is like another one. <laughs> right. Right. And and that's the thing is is you know you've designed hundreds and hundreds of of, of hand props, just like I have built. A lot of those, uh, yeah, um, and it's and it's hard to say because you know if if you put it more in categories of like, well, what what Cardassian piece did you like the best? Oh, well, that's that. Or if it's you know any race, but when you're talking about the Federation stuff, there was so much of it. Yes, but but the 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 three the three basics that uh -huh. came over from the original series, the communicator. The tricorder yep. and the phaser. Yeah. Okay. Um, and those and, are always the staples of every single series. Yeah, exactly. And you know, and and uh, uh, after that would be things like the hypo spray. Yeah. Um, when when uh, when I got involved with the motion picture, um, there was a lot of reinventing going on. Uh huh. Okay. In 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 every aspect of, of that, that film, okay? Um, reinventing from the original series, okay? Well, when TNG happened, we started reinventing again, okay? How do you make this stuff cooler and, you know, fun to use and, and recognizable to the audience? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if, I, if I look at, science fiction equipment now uh-huh okay um where's my phone um <laughs> it's all in the phone right right everything everything that you, you could want in a communicator or a tricorder yeah. <laughs> maybe not the phaser <laughs> but uh, you know uh what would what would the typical Starfleet crewmen need now, okay? One gizmo, basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I'm, you know, I, I've, I've, I've talked with the fans, and, and I said, look, if, if I had to design something right now for a movie, I would be scratching my head a lot. How do you make something cooler than a simple slab that does everything? Okay, so that's tricky. That's a tricky thing, uh, oh, yeah. you know. But but it but it is possible. It is possible. Okay, yeah. you look at you look at things like uh, like the expanse. Yeah. Okay, and I'm I'm not a huge fan of 3D holograms that float in midair, but yeah. some shows make it work. Yeah. Okay. Or, you know, or the or the or the prop that suddenly. Is this big and it folds up into that big? Yeah, you know, and it's like, okay, well, uh, the physics doesn't quite work, but okay, not yet. Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, but you know, I'm 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 very happy with um, you know, a number of things that I did for the franchise in different cultures. Okay, the Romulan right. pad, the Romulan pad, I I I, I totally love it. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, it's, you can actually read it. Yeah. Well, I mean, every, every culture has a pad, right? Yeah. Of okay. course. Klingons have a pad. We have a pad. Romulans have a pad. The Cardassians had one. The Bajorans had, you know, everybody had some kind of an information device. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the Romulan pad, you know, to me was, was very, you know, was very curvy, very retro. Um, you know, and I, I got to tell you, you know, with some of the things that I've designed over the years, I look back at things like Flash Gordon. Okay. Uh -huh. I go back to the 30s on some of the styling. Yes, updated. But 
you know, you go back and you look at some of the stuff that happened in in the, the mid to late 30s, and they were astoundingly cool. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and, and they had a lot of style. They, they weren't just... Yeah. They weren't just a, a, a little cell phone. They right. Had, they had flair to them. They had style. Exactly. exactly. And that's, and, you know, it, it, well, it's like the Bride of Chaotica. Uh, the Voyager. Episode. Exactly. Exactly. How do you how do you not go back to, to actual Flash right. Gordon? Exactly. And you know, exactly. Crusty Crab and all that stuff and go. Okay. Okay. Now just stop and listen to this. This is what we're gonna do. You know. Or you look at you look at the uh, okay you look at things to come from 1936. Uh huh. I would have I would have if I could go back in time. Okay. I would try to get a job in their art department. <laughs> uh-huh. You know? uh, that was amazing for, for 1936. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I always loved that type of... I even like Forbidden Planet when they were showing the, exactly. the underground. It's like, exactly. ow. Yeah. The yeah. grandeur of it and the thought that went into it, it's all animation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know. Um, so, let's, who else? There's, there's, there's another question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the, the, the second one first, and then the, then the, the first one second. Uh, do you think an artist who, who wants to be an illustrator, should actually know how to draw with a pen and pencil before moving on to digital? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know what actual, how things work. Learn, you know, um, I, I have I have said this in you know in in interviews. I have said this uh, online on uh, in written form. Learn the basics of art, okay? Learn about learn about impressionist art. Learn how to use a stick of charcoal on a newsprint pad. Um, play with acrylics, play with watercolors, uh, get some good basic art history books, okay? Um, you know, look at what Monet did, look at Picasso, look at John Martin, uh, look at, at every different style of art, uh, look at sculpture, okay? Look at Greek and Roman um, uh, uh, artwork. Um, you, you know, look what's on the walls in in you know in the the Egyptian crypts and things. Uh, you know, learn all of that before you attempt to get into things like CGI. Okay, um, there are some there are some amazingly good technicians out there yeah but they have no soul okay and see that, if that and, makes and, a, sense. And, and a lot of people aren't going to understand that is because they, they they're 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 a technician they're not an artist right and, you know and th yes they <laughs> may know they may know their tools okay uh and and uh um and, you know, this is not to say that everybody in CG or the games industry or, you know, anyone, anyone using high tech, uh, 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 this is not to say that they don't understand mm -hmm. the history of the art that came before, uh, because a lot of them uh, seem to have a very, very good grasp uh, on visuals on composition on lighting um on uh, uh you know shades and tints and uh, you know all of the all of the the all of the art things that involved hands-on uh -huh. brushes pencils pens um you know i mean get get you know get a bottle of india ink and a brush pen and play with calligraphy or, 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 you know, play with, um, um, you know, let's say, uh, you know, uh, Chinese or Japanese characters. Okay. 
learn different styles and learn different cultures. Um, um, you know, I, I, I never, ever, ever regret the art history classes that I took in school. Okay, I was an art major for two full years, and yes, I took a lot of studio courses, but I also totally loved the art history courses. You know, so I could I could go to my big you know Jansen's History of Art. I could go to that book, and I could point it at things and say, okay, look, you should be looking at this, or you should be looking at this. Uh, you know, and I, it, it, I think it helps. I think it helps. I, I think it helps because you could once again take that same book to a director and go, "Well, what's the style? Did you want something like this? Do you want Baroque? Do you want Renaissance? Do you want this type of feel to it?" Mm -hmm. Oh you yeah, know, yeah. And it, yeah. It helps a whole lot. Now, the one thing that I remember, um, and it was reinforced when I was when I was working at Weta. Um, was that uh, a lot of people who are artists don't understand that a silhouette is very important because it helps you, you're, you know, since we're visual people, it helps you to, to remember who that character is. Mm -hmm. you know, if you look at a silhouette of Darth Vader, you know it's Darth Vader. Exactly. And, and exactly. so on. Yes. And, if you're looking at a at a uh, a submarine silhouette, you know that's a submarine, and so on. It's it's understanding also about shapes, mm -hmm. and the, right? You know, and the contours and the blending of those shapes that create everything. Right. Well, you know, and, and to that point, uh, uh, when we were when we were doing like hundreds of doodles of uh, Deep Space Nine. Uh -huh. Trying to get a handle on it, okay. Um, you know, Rick Berman said, "Look, this has got to be a simple thing that any kid can draw in a few strokes." You know, and he he was totally right. He was totally right. Um, and we had, uh, you know, we had the oil platform style that they initially kind of suggested to us, uh, and then it turned into a a circular thing. With with hula hoops going in all different directions. I remember and, seeing that drawing. And we're, you know, I mean, because we, I won't say we were floundering, but we were trying lots and lots of different shapes. Okay, and to me, most of them made some sort of engineering sense. Uh huh. Okay. Yes. Okay. The big hoops around the station. Yes, you could go in dock uh, at different points. Right. And then and then uh, Berman said, look. Break the hoops. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> uh huh. And that's how we got the upper pylons, the lower pylons, and from that, it's like okay, it all gelled. It all came together. Um, you know, and and yes, you know, uh, Cardassian style developed. Uh -huh. We had we had sweeping curves, but we also had you know, hardware chunks that you could whack with a spanner, mm -hmm. you know, um, and we made it work, you know, so. <laughs> okay, so the next question is, how has 3D printing slash drawing challenged your design work? You know, I am I am watching what a number of my friends are doing in the 3D arena. Mm -hmm. uh, I have not had that much done by 3D printing, mm -hmm. but I know what it is. I know how it works. Um, I actually had some some uh, 3D planetary uh, surfaces done for the Griffith Observatory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, you, you know, that's, that's sort of been the extent of my involvement, uh, uh, which to me is kind of amazing because <clears throat> one of the 3D models was uh, the surface of Mars, 
okay, a section of Mars that uh, should still be on display at the Griffith, okay? Think about this, the data, the data for that 3D print came from 35 million miles away. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. And it came down, it, it came down as a, a, a big, um, um, you know, elevation, a digital elevation file. That file got massaged by a company in North Carolina, I think, came back to a company in Valencia called Sicon Technologies. They did this massive 3D print uh, in a big UV cured machine. Okay. And it's like <laughs> holding this piece of Mars. Yeah. You know, where the information came from the planet. <laughs> and so, you know, so, you know, but I, I have seen, you know, I, I, I have been watching developments in 3D printing. I know, I know folks who have UV machines, um, you know, filament machines, all of these different, you know, you were talking about getting some, right? Or you have I, some? I have like eight or nine machines. Well, okay, all right. One yeah. of them is a, me a meter by a meter by a half meter. So. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, you know, you you understand what's involved in these things, okay? Um, uh, I understand from a, you know, let's say a, a, a CG file standpoint, uh, okay, I, I, I need to minimize the number of facets in this particular shape, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and then hand it off to somebody who understands the machine, okay? I don't have a machine, but I know how to get to a certain point before handing off the job. Uh -huh. Okay, that kind of thing. And I have seen, you know, I've seen friends of mine who uh, who are doing astounding uh, uh, spaceship replica parts, mm -hmm. um, future, you know, future spaceship designs that nobody has seen before, um, you know, kaiju, you know, monster oh, three yeah. prints, um, uh, you know, busts of, uh, of um, um, you know, uh, SF and fantasy characters. Uh, to me, it's, it's just an amazing thing to watch evolve. Um, oh, yeah. I got to hang out with some of the folks at Gentle Giant Studios. Mm -hmm. And they, at the time, they were doing characters from The Matrix. Okay, so here's this, here's this, uh, like, you know, uh, the eight inch tall um, uh, figure of Morpheus. And it, this was, this I think was back in 2006 or thereabouts. Okay, this was, this was some time ago now. Uh -huh. And it looked like Lawrence Fishburne. It okay. looked like him. Why? Because they had laser scanned him. Yeah. You know, I actually do that now myself too. I have a, 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 a B scanner. <laughs> yeah, I mean, have you got a handheld scanner? Yeah, I've seen those things, uh, and they've got the lidar systems for doing entire streets. Oh yeah, you know, and they, amazing. You know, so I, I'm I'm happy that I understand a lot of the lingo. Right. Okay. Um. So the the big lidar system, no, it doesn't instantly build polygons but it's a point cloud thing yeah. and okay so so i kind of have the basics in my head uh-huh um and it's just to see how this whole industry is evolving is is astounding um uh some of us in the space art field we have been to places like uh, uh the space tech expo in pasadena Mm -hmm. And a lot of the exhibitors there are into 3D printing metal. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's the they're, new stuff. They're the making rocket 3D, engines. Yeah, 3D they're centering. making rocket engine components. Oh, they're yeah. making, you know, telemetry antennas, and they're doing it in 3D. Yeah. And, not just, and not just prototyping for, you know, for, for showing off. Okay, this is what our thing will eventually look like. This is the thing that we're making. Well, the Falcon that just went up had a 3D, yeah. the, 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 the bells 
the rocket cells were all 3D printed mm -hmm. that way. Yeah, That's yeah. Amazing. Yeah, and you, and you look at the, like the, uh, the, uh, uh, the guy sending up the electron rocket. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, and, you know, so many parts of that are 3D printed. So I, I can't wait to see where it goes. I really can't. Oh, yeah. Well, the, once yeah. again, the replicator. Yeah. Well, you know. sort of, yeah. <laughs> well, just, we're just not using atoms now. Right, yeah. yeah. Yet, yet. Okay, here's one. Was there a set or prop or costume? So in other words, a prop, probably. Um, that you were dumbfounded with at the last moment came up with something. Okay, so, so so did something stump me until I had a eureka moment, maybe? I, I think that's um, the question. It's it's uh yeah, I think that's the, the kind of question because you know, I, I I can't I can't think of any I can't think of any one prop um that well, okay, yes I can. <laughs> um there was a script, I think it was a Deep Space Nine story. Uh, some aliens had the most fabulous object in the galaxy. And we had no idea. Okay. Uh, I yeah, cause, cause, cause that's a, such a great description. <laughs> yeah. Well, fabulous it, device in the galaxy. It Can was... I well, it was an art object, uh, uh, I think, and and but it was the most valuable, most amazing object in the entire galaxy. Okay, and that's that's all the script said. Yes, I do remember this, um, and I think Ricardo Delgado and I were were trying to come up with all different ideas for this thing. Um, no, it may. Oh, well, maybe it was after Ricardo. Maybe it was John Eaves, because we had Ricardo, we had Jim Martin, and we have we had John Eaves yeah. uh, on DS9. Well, one of them. Okay, um, we were we were just sketching and sketching and sketching, and, and yes, it was alien, so it didn't have to be, you know, uh, based Sorry, on. Uh, huh? It didn't have to be a Federation aesthetic. No, and it didn't even have to be, you know, Earth or yeah, you know exactly. uh, uh, any, you know, any Earth culture, um, uh, past or present or whatever. Okay, it just had to be some fabulous art object. Okay, and I started thinking about a Fabergé egg. Okay, but alien. Right. Okay, and um, I don't think any of my sketches were, were chosen, okay? But it was it, it was like one of those very rare occasions where it's like, uh, okay, you don't like that here, here. Let me let me do a couple more drawings. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, until, until I settled on something uh, that, uh, that uh, my other artist colleague uh, had come up with. I'd have to go look it up, but it was, I think, I want to say it was Ricardo, but it might have might have been John. So. Now, 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 now. So it was it was a like a Fabergé egg, but it had three brass legs on it. That's what we ended up doing. Okay, and uh, now I do not recall exactly what it ended up looking like. Because there is a because there is a Faber there is a Fabergé like egg. That we did end up doing for DS9. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, and it was like, and it, and it get went to from, that point. Yeah. You know, I don't know. You know. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, well, I mean, and that's the thing is, as in, then after, even after you're done with it, you know, it has to go to Joe Longo, and him go. You know, we're going to have to cost reduce this. <laughs> so all yeah. this, you know, some of those things are like. Oh, and we're gonna have this wires coming out here, and some chain, and some blah blah, blah. and yeah. then all of a sudden it's a ball. Here, there's a ball. Did you do the uh, Did you do the the alien clock from DS9? The 
alien clock. And yeah, it was. Oh, oh you mean the Bajoran one? Was it a Bajoran one? Okay, so, but yeah, it, 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 it had had, yeah, very, very different yes. Yes. angled yes. planes and so forth. I thought that was a fabulous. Uh, it, it had a fabulous look to it. Oh no, I. I uh, it, it was. And, it, it was it was a fabulous prop when it was done. Yeah, we just we just had issues building it the first time. Okay, was that was that like 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 was it silk screen on plexi or was it photo oh. etched? Oh no, no, <laughs> nothing that nothing that 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 uh, far uh, asking for. Um, <laughs> no, we ended up finding a. Uh, a, a laser person, a person who actually had a laser back then. Okay. And we laser cut the discs. Okay, so the hole in the center and so on. But ah. not but not etching the surface. Okay. Which is what I requested, but but that would have taken a lot more work and we only had two days to build it. Um but basically so we had this so we had the discs done and then our uh, one, one of the guys at the shop, I'm not going to mention names, one of the guys at the shop decided he was going to help us put the detail on each disc. So, so he went on, covered it in tape, and then, you know, cut stencil on every single piece. Ah, okay. So that, you know, so when we sprayed it, but he decided, okay, and remember, that's clear plexi. Right. First, first thing, clear plexi. So he decided he was going to prime the surface for us and then paint it. Wait, wait. On clear plastic. <laughs> so okay. that, that, that the final co color was a uh, was was one of the Bajoran uh, uh, like eighty sixty nine or one of those numbers. Um, uh, kind of top, coppery, coppery bronzy color. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And that was going to be the final color on the piece. But since he primed it on all of the pieces before we told him, and we told him, don't prime anything. Oh, God. <laughs> so he primed every single piece. Okay, okay. all right, all right. So, so we're like, oh, great. Okay, because we thought he had, because he brought it to us with just that, with the finished color on it. Then we turned it over and go, what did you do? So we had... With everything else we were doing for the show that week, and we were still building the bases and stuff, because all that had squiggly lines drawn, hand drawn on it, um, and all the brass inlay and all that other stuff we did on it, we called in another person who was a graphic artist and painter and said, look, this is what we need you to do. You're going to take this paint pen, and you're going to trace on the back side to cover up as much of the gray so it's not visible from from if you're looking at it oh, 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 okay so, so when you look at it at a slight angle you can still see all the the primer under there which were like ah i i, I mean i mean you, you don't notice these things in, in a shot exactly yeah. now see uh, this is this, this to me is is interesting because uh you know, yes, I saw the sketches of it, right? Uh, and I saw it in the show, okay. But it's amazing to me how much missing history. You know, people don't get to hear. Oh yeah. Uh, and you know, until until we end up talking like this. Oh you know? yeah, and, and that's and that's the thing. Okay. And, yeah. and it is, and that is a an amazing looking piece. It really is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and but. But it's just, it's just once again the shenanigans and stuff that in, happen when you're trying to build something like this in a hurry, yeah. Yeah. and then suddenly, oh, it's like, oh, don't yeah. do that. Just don't help me. <laughs> Same thing with the auto yeah. bucket. Same thing with the auto bucket. Okay. Uh, we have, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. We built the auto bucket one evening. Yeah. We had finished it at eleven thirty at night. Uh. <laughs> our, our our one of our guys. I'm gonna do it again. One of our guys came in in the morning. Okay, the drawing is sitting next to the bucket. It's finished, ready to go to set. One of our guys comes in at four thirty in the morning and goes, 
oh, I wonder if those guys are done with the bucket. Now, Odo's bucket's like this, with the opening on top. He yeah, and it's, and it's got the little designs on the sides. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it's like this. It's, it's like a volcano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So he comes in and flips out and, and, quote, fixes it for us. He plugs the top, turns it over, cuts the bottom out. What? What? Cuts the bottom out and leaves us a dirty note saying, why can't you guys get this right? You know, you, it's a bucket. So we come in and, and then he leaves to go to a meeting oh for some other show. Uh, he comes in, uh, he comes back in after we're scrambling around trying to fix what he, he, he just destroyed. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. And because it's, it's first shot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So we're okay. scrambling to, to fix it when he and we're getting ready to go out the door. So we've got it fixed, but it, it I I I was ashamed of bringing it to Joe. I had to explain to Joe what happened. He went, he needs to stay away from your stuff. Yeah. So yeah. so so we're carrying it back out with new wet paint to go to set. It's gonna go into my car. Which I have to drive out to the studio oh, at, yeah. <laughs> at, at, at at six o'clock in the morning, and and I've got the heat. It, it, this is in the middle of, of not. I shouldn't say it's the middle of the summer, but it's not exactly the coolest time of the year. Right. And I've and I've had to turn the heaters on in the car oh, to help, help drive the paint <laughs> while I'm going down there. So I've yeah. got the the, the 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 foot heaters going on with it sitting on the floor and trying to drive carefully. Crazy, crazy stuff. The, crazy and, stuff. But as we're as we're leaving, he's coming and going. I don't see how you guys just don't understand how any of this stuff works, do you? Because blah blah blah. It's like, did you look at the drawing? Well, what do you mean? This is the top. That's the bottom. Oh, oh well, we guys fixed it. It was like no apology, no nothing. It was just like, so, uh, uh. Those, those types of things are the ones you go. Stop touching it. <laughs> you know, or 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 the, what's even worse is when they, you're you're doing stuff, and they come in and go, "Is this wet?" Yeah. And you're like, "Yes, yes." <laughs> and it was done being painted, but not anymore. Uh, let's see. Right. So. Uh, how is the stress level working on an episodic TV show like Star Trek? <laughs> Depending on what department you're in. <laughs> uh, episodic television is a harsh mistress. Okay. Um, yes, it was. It, it, it could get stressful. Um, but, it, you know, we got into... Uh, you know, and and I have I have a a very limited I have a very limited vision of this because I was at one studio mm -hmm. for a very long time, okay, uh, and eventually we got into a you know we got into a routine we learned how things worked exactly rhythm uh, you know and and uh, you know luckily we had a lot of folks who were of a like mind, uh, who understood the system, uh, who understood what stuff had to get done. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we did it and we did it. Um, uh, at the end of, uh, you know, any, at the end of any particular season, um, there was always the possibility that, Hey, we weren't coming, we weren't coming back after uh -huh. hiatus. Okay. Uh, and we we kind of learned to to uh, accept that, okay. Um, and the fact that we were there for so long, okay. Mm -hmm. And you know, and the gang who, uh, um, you know, the the uh, the DS9 art department, which was also the feature art department, which was also the uh, enterprise art department. Mm -hmm. Okay. They continued on after, you know, after I had finished up, uh, with Voyager, uh -huh. um, you know, and, uh, and, and now, 
you know, I, I, I do not have a clue as to uh, how things worked on Discovery or on Picard, uh, but I, I've got to believe that everything is, is different now. Okay, uh, I, I know I know that some folks who uh, um, uh, some folks who worked on Discovery uh, yeah, also I'm worked on the Expanse. Okay, um, so you you you're now talking about uh, people who are not you know in the art department day after day. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are independent contractors now. Yeah. You know, they're independent vendors who do a lot of design work, okay? Which is not the way we did things, but it's, it, it seems to be the way things are happening now. Um, you know, and you, you, look at, uh, you look at things like uh, uh, the games industry or major films that involve a lot of CGI. You've got pipelines going all over the globe okay oh yeah so so you've got you know you've got shops in thailand or in australia or in europe okay and they're all working to put a production together okay um you know for me at paramount um you know it was a terrific experience uh you know most of the most of the, the other crafts that we dealt with were like right there on the lot. Uh -huh. You know, I could go to the sign shop. I could go to the uh, you know you know to the uh, the, um, uh, the paint yeah. shop. Go to the mill. Okay, uh, everything was like right there. Yeah. Okay. So if there was a question about uh, you know how something how something had to be built. Um, you know, I could go to the, the mill and talk to the guys there and say you know and show them a drawing. Uh -huh. That kind of thing. Um, so I, I just, you know, I had a ball. I had a ball doing that. Yeah. No, my, my only, whenever I had stress was because somebody was doing something to stop us from moving forward, and we still had the same deadline. You know, yeah, yeah, such, I know. Such, I such know. as, such as that, <laughs> such as that person yeah. making arbitrary decisions on something they didn't even know about. You know. I, it was, I would have to say, working on Trek, but, you know, once again, while I was working on Trek, I was working on other shows as well. You know, we did Space Above and Beyond, we did uh, Earth 2, and blah, 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 and stuff like that, um, in between everything else, as well as Trek. And I have to say, as far as shows went, Star Trek was was a working machine that's been tuned to get everything that was necessary done mm -hmm. to, re to reduce the stress on the whole crowd. Whereas, mm -hmm. on, whereas on other shows, not so much. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I mean, we, we heard, we heard, that, you know, bits and pieces of stories of, uh, uh, you know, things that were happening across the lot um, you know, in the, in the, uh, uh, production offices and things like that. And, you know, it, stuff happens. Yep. Okay. Um, you know, the different departments, uh, you know, end up getting things fixed and, and exactly. yeah. things, got exactly. done. things got done, things got fixed, you know? Yeah. I, I always <laughs> thought, I, I always thought it was really funny though, when, you know, when DS9 came out and then Babylon 5 came out, and there, there was all that, well, they stole our idea. But, but what was funny is, is during DS9, we, the shop I was working at at the time was also working on Babylon 5 at the same time. <laughs> so we got art from both of them. And like, they're not the same, guys. They're not the same. It's not yeah. a big deal. You know? It's a different style. This is the this style. That's that style. So yeah. I never had the conflict, you know. Uh, and when every, when when a new show would start up, of course we always had some of the fans who were like, "Oh, I'm not going to watch that because it's it's not it doesn't sync up with this and it it, it loses that." 
And I went, look, take each show as its own show. Mm -hmm. And then I said, because in the beginning, we're kind of like, we don't know what's going on. And then everything will end up linking up in the end like it's supposed to. And I said, you know, I, I, I watched all of Discovery so far. Uh -huh. And it's like, it's not exactly my Star Trek, but it's pretty damn fun. Uh-huh. Okay. I enjoy it. I, we, we did and, some you know, of the I, I, stuff for that. You know? there's, a, there's a lot of stuff in Discovery where I would like really scratch my head. It's like, uh -huh. wait, wait a second. How, how does that, how, how did he uh -huh. do that? How did this work? How did she go? The, the... It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, okay. Like, oh, please. I mean, it's you know, it, yes, you can, you know, I, I could have, I can have discussions with my, my, uh, you know, Trek fan pals about certain things in other shows, other movies. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Trek 2009 and the ones that came after, but oh, the, the alternate universe versions. Yeah, I you know I I could I could start thinking about all right how does this work with how does this universe work with that universe, right. uh, but after a while you know I I it's it just got to be too much. So I have I I I have I have my head cannon. Right. Okay. Um. Discovery's fun. Uh, I will eventually see the rest of Picard. Uh -huh. um, I'm desperately waiting for the next season of The Expanse. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm such a I'm such a, an Expanse fanatic. Okay, uh, and, and and I'm sure I'm sure you can see why. Well, there's lots of stuff. Well, I mean, there's so many shows out right now that if you're if you're a, if you're a tech geek. How could you not like all these new shows? Yeah. Well, I I, I, I I have seen some of them and they, they don't do a thing for me. Okay. Yeah. But The Expanse is so smartly put together. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, you know, some of the little tech things in it, like the Epstein drive. Okay. There's no damn way in the universe that thing could work. But. It's internally consistent. Okay. So. That's, that's it, it. Works, it works episode after episode. And I don't worry about it. Okay. Um, in the shows that I, I got to work on, and, you know, and, and between Mike Okuda and myself, we wrote like at least 1,600 pages of memos. Uh-huh. Okay, about the tech, about the science, uh, not forcing them to listen to particular ideas, but offering, okay, look, this is what we think, you know, this would look like or how this would work. Okay, and they, they you know, the producers and the writers were very, very good listeners. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, otherwise they could have shut us down, you know, year one. Yeah. All right. But they did, you know. We 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 offered ideas, um, and uh, I mean to the point where to the point where Jerry Taylor, okay, she desperately wanted some opportunity for Voyager to drop antimatter pods as depth charges. Uh huh. <laughs> okay. She got it. She understood. She she got this stuff right. Um, and I was more than happy to help make that happen. Uh huh. Okay. You know, like, okay, now how would this work? Okay, down on deck 15, and we do this, that, and the other, and blah, blah, blah. All right. So those sorts of things worked really well. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's, there's certain things in the, the universe of shows that I worked on where it's like, no, nah, I wouldn't exactly do that, so I'm going to change my idea of it and uh -huh. just store it away up here in the cortex. You, right. know? Uh, you know, and and that's okay. Everybody's got their own they, they, they've got their own ideas. Yeah. You know? 
and, yeah. and, and I think that's that's totally fine. Okay, um, you know, and and I've even thought of, you know, a way to 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 bring in some new nasty bad characters mm -hmm. with some crazy tech problems and solutions. Um, and you know, I'm not I'm not transmitting them out to everybody, but I'm kind of like thinking. <laughs> And, and I'm scribbling notes about, okay, how would I do this in like a post-Voyager situation? Right. Okay, new bad guys, new ship, new crew, new problems. Yeah. You know, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a fun, Trek has always been a, like a fun foundation to build on. Yeah, for that. You know? And yeah, you know, again, some of the newer productions, they're not exactly my track, but I'm not going to, like, smash them to bits. <laughs> right. Well, and, that, and, that's, and that's the reason why I said, I, that's why I always look at each incarnation as its own show. Because, once again, this doesn't fit with this. What's going on? Right, well, right, right. If I, if I want to noodle it too much, I'm not going to be able to sit down and watch a show. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I took, you know, I, I took Discovery as, okay, this is, this is a story set in some part of the overall scenario. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, some, and, some, wherever it is, it's fine. And, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed uh -huh. it. I, I wasn't sure, but I was like, oh, hey, yeah, this is pretty cool. Uh -huh. <laughs> So where are we? Where are we? Well, okay, so we are at letting people know that a lot because a lot of people don't know that you are actually into Japanese anime and, and mecha and everything else. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, dirty pear and so on. And now some people go, What's dirty pear? But hey guys, just go look it up. It's a great show. Go look it up. Yeah. Along with a bunch of uh, you know, yeah, yeah, it's it might be old as far as people are concerned, but it's a classic. Well, there's, a, there's a continuity there's a continuity of, of my anime watching over the years okay uh -huh. uh, some friends went to Japan and came back with a VHS cassette of Naushika uh -huh. okay, in 1985 maybe uh -huh. no translation Japanese videotape mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there watching this and it's like these guys have been busy since uh, Speed Racer <laughs> oh yeah and i watched this thing and i didn't know everything that they were well i didn't know anything that, that they were saying but the way they said the way the action played out it's like oh my god so i became an instant miyazaki fanatic uh -huh. right? um and yes everything in the 80s uh gal force uh, dirty pair uh project echo uh, i mean you know just a whole range of things to watch. Um, my first uh, exposure to uh, Macross. Uh -huh. um, oh my goodness, you know, and uh, Space Battleship Yamato. Uh -huh. You can acquire shelffuls of of CDs and DVDs and and uh, Blu-rays of all this stuff. I am very happy that the industry is is still cooking. Oh yeah, I mean that. It's it's when I go to a different friends' houses, you know, it's oh well. You want to watch some anime? Sure. Do you have something that's that's pre two thousand? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, but I mean, like the Ghost in the Shell stuff. You know, there's there's the older stuff and there's the newer stuff. And yeah, I'm, not, I'm actually liking the older stuff than the newer stuff. Same here. Yeah. I've been I've been watching it, but but you know, once again, at least. It's still progressing. That's that's the thing I like about uh, about uh, the the anime is is you never know what they're going to come out with next because it's like wow people are really uh, starting to churn stuff out and with Netflix help they're doing so many more things. Yeah, well that can be both good and bad. Yes, well and, uh, and there is good uh, and bad. <laughs> uh, I mean you, you know. Uh, yeah. Anime, anime has, uh, I, I won't say it has driven um, much of my design work, but uh, 
it is all part of that same culture of, of science fiction and fantasy and animation. Um, and all the tech. All that uh, tech. Yeah, well. Oh, okay. I have I have a, a, a few of us who have worked on track um, have met uh, Shoji Karamori, mm -hmm. Mr. Macross. And Karamori signed my my Macross uh, big art book. Okay, and uh, uh, when he he came he, he came to visit uh, uh, Paramount during one of the big anime conventions, oh, and oh. we showed him around the sets. Uh, oh, next oh. gen, and it was uh, it was uh, it was like, you know, oh my goodness. <laughs> you know? uh, so yeah, you know, I mean, I, I've I've tried to maintain a um, uh, you know a, a connection to some of the people who worked in in anime. Uh, I got to meet um, uh, Toshio Okada, who was uh, with Gainax. Okay, and uh, he was one of the people responsible for uh, Royal Space Force: The Wings of Oniamis, which to to me to to this day is is you know one of my uh, one of my you know main collectible films. Um, also got to meet up with uh, Mr. Imagawa, who was a director on uh, Gundam mm -hmm. and Giant Robo. Oh, oh. Okay. And, uh, you know, just fun stuff. Got to meet uh, Kenichi Sonoda. Uh -huh. Wonderful character artist. Um, you know, so I, it, back in the 90s, you know, I got to, I got to, uh, you know, I went to a, a number of anime conventions, mostly up in the Bay Area. And uh, it was, it was just great to be able to actually meet some of the artists involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and see what was new and you know interesting for for the nineties, you know. And and now all the stuff is coming out on on uh, you know on my my big flat screen. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. You can't you can't yeah. go wrong with that because you know back in the uh, the eighties it was like I you know we at my house we had little tiny color TVs as always, and now as as you're as, as you're putting in the Blu-ray in for some of these older shows, you're like, wow, I never <laughs> noticed all of that. You know? And, and that's the yeah. thing. Is there's, there's, there, there, most people, when they watch anime, they don't see, they just see the character. They don't see all everything that went into it. It's all the background details. It's all of the, yeah. you know, the cinematic uh just the detail that goes into those. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you you, you know, you look at something like the the original Ghost in the Shell, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, gets to Innocence, and you just look at the backgrounds mm -hmm. and the architecture and and vehicles and just the amount of detail. You know, and, and th that that stuff inspires me. Okay, right. um, you know, to to come up with things that are like that, but not like that. Right. You know, grand the grandeur of it all. Yeah. Uh, and and if they have if, if if everybody hasn't already noticed that you have a huge interest in space exploration, and and everything that has to do with the, the galaxy here. Oh, uh, uh, may it, It's up to you if you want to discuss some more stuff and tell them what you're, you're involved with with that, but also maybe some, uh, mention some of the websites maybe that they can go and look and maybe they can be inspired by, you know, like that, that the uh, Mars habitat you were working on during DS9. Or was it Voyager? I don't remember now. Uh, no, you, Voyager was the, uh, uh, we had uh, an episode called One Small Step. Oh, no, I'm talking about the real habitat that you were doing that, you were helping to do a prototype. For oh, an oh, oh, that, I, I had this crazy idea to, to build the uh, uh, cockpit of a Mars lander. Uh, you know, as, a, as I was saying, you know, I was, I was a, I was a space geek from, from, you know, the time I was a small kid. 
okay, growing up when when all of this was developing, okay. Uh, I don't know if you can see over my shoulder, but uh, there's a big uh, interplanetary spacecraft here mm -hmm. and an older design from Chesney Bonestell, which was on a TV show called Men Into Space. 1959, I watched every episode as an eight-year-old. <laughs> You know, and now I've got this this model that I built. Okay, so um, the space exploration and visualizing space. All right, and, and, you know they they've gone together for me. Okay, right. for forever. All right, um, I you know I, I I told folks that maybe Star Trek was a like a 15 year detour, um, but Trek and real space were were. Uh, we're actually intertwined. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it wasn't a detour. It was simply another DNA strand, right? Uh -huh. um, if folks want to see what a lot of us are doing in the space art field, and it's not just, you know, stars and planets, okay, but a lot of space exploration. Um, hardware, uh, documenting missions, and so forth. Go to IAAA.org, okay? IAAA.org. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful group. We started it back in uh, around 1983. Um, and uh, a number of us who had uh, been illustrators in um, the science magazines, uh, the astronomy magazines, uh, you know, projects like Cosmos. Mm -hmm. um, we we got together in the early '80s and uh, formed uh, formed the IAAA, um, and we currently have about uh, I, th I think our membership uh, director said we we have maybe 191 members around mm -hmm. the world. Um, a big contingent in the UK, um, uh, a lot of folks in uh, uh, the Tucson area. Um, uh, I mean, we're 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 all over the place, um, and it's it's uh, it's a nice place to see what uh, what each artist is working on. I mean, we, you know, there's some of us doing CGI, uh, some doing you know impressionist views of the Milky Way, okay? Mm -hmm. So that there, there's every kind of, every style of, of art you can think of. Uh, we have uh, model makers who are into uh, uh, space models. Uh -huh. uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great place to start to, to see, um, you know, how we visualize the things that are like out there. Okay, uh, we have uh, an IAAA uh, page on Facebook, uh, so people can look for us there. Uh, I think the, I think we have a presence on Twitter. I have to I have to check a lot of this stuff because I'm not on every different service. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so it's a uh, you know it's a it's a it's a fun field. There's a lot of there's a lot of real science involved, and it's also just 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 art, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. uh, different styles of art that don't necessarily have to be scientifically perfect, uh -huh. okay? Uh, so we, uh, you know, we're, we're very, uh, we're very accepting of lots of different styles. Right. I think that, uh, you know, a, a lot of people who are into track are obviously into space travel in one way or another, mm -hmm. because if you weren't, you wouldn't be watching Star Trek, um, unless it's just yeah. an escape. And listen, oh, I, I got to tell you one thing. Um, I was invited out to the Goddard Space Flight Center uh, a couple of years back to uh, give a talk on the connection between NASA and Trek. Uh -huh. And the, the Trek fans at Goddard were, were there were very many. <laughs> Uh, with you know, with things like posters and models hanging from their ceilings and, and this sort of thing, uh, uh, Dr. Ken Carpenter, who uh, who is the guy who uh, uh, invited me out, Ken's a huge fan, 
and he was, uh, you know, he was a, a major, uh, major player in the uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. Cool. Yeah. That's so, really cool. Uh, you know, the, uh, NASA and Trek, you know, have have gone together, you know, for 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 ages. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> like like when the original original cast went out to uh, Cape Canaveral and did the, uh, you know, the the tour of the um, the space shuttle and. All mm -hmm. that other stuff. So, yeah, yeah. very cool. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, then I will end our recording here. Thank you for being here. <laughs>